Okay, Kelly, I'm going to go ahead and start. Are you good? Okay. Yep, I'm good. Okay. All right, I'm going to go ahead um, and, and start tonight's webinar. I'd like to welcome everyone who's joining us to our Returning to School 2021, Is Your Child Worried? Uh, Kelly and I thought this was a very timely presentation for us to share some information and maybe help uh, the parents out because it's been a long, difficult year. Kids are going back to school, many of them full time after a year of um, being either part time or home. So I'm sure there are some concerns and we, we think some of the information we have to share will help. Um, as you realize, everyone at home is muted, but there is a chat box that you can type your questions in and we will save time at the end to address any questions. We hope to wrap this up and go through the slides in approximately 20 to 25 minutes and leave that five minutes at the end for any of your questions. Anything that um, we can't get to, you can certainly reach out to myself or Kelly. So my name is Dr. Colleen Mattimore. I'm a pediatrician at Western New York Pediatrics, and my co-presenter is? Hi, I'm Kelly Thompson. I'm the licensed mental health counselor at Western New York Pediatrics. Okay, and thanks again for joining us. Okay, so tonight um, we're just gonna be discussing different types of anxiety. We're going to identify symptoms of anxiety. Uh, we'll discuss how COVID had impacted children and their level of anxiety, how parents can help their children to manage that anxiety, um, and help them to face their fears. And at the end, we'll go over a few resources that will be available to families. So what is anxiety? So anxiety is a normal emotion. It causes increased alertness, fear, and some physical symptoms. It's typically referred to as the body's flight or fight or sometimes freeze response. So we either want to fight what we feel in danger of, run away from it, or sometimes we're just pretty much frozen in fear. Um, so we can't respond. And keep in mind that some degree of anxiety in kids is pretty appropriate. It's normal. Um, and some degree of anxiety is good. It helps kids make good decisions. It keeps us safe. And throughout the years, kids will come in contact with different stressors and worries. So it's totally appropriate, uh, normal level of worry. So we thought to frame that, we would just review for everyone some typical fears that are grouped by ages. And I think most of the parents um, will be familiar with some of these. Um, infants and toddlers fear separation from their caregivers. Uh, loud noises, they often cover up their ears, and they have stranger danger, what we refer to as stranger danger. Our two to three-year-olds or toddlers can be afraid of animals, darkness, thunder and lightning, and be very cautious around water, like at beaches or pools. At four to five, kids have great imaginations. Um, they'll be afraid of bugs. They, they're afraid of getting lost. They are afraid of monsters, which can be seen very real to them. And they'll start to worry about um, death and, and especially parents' death. Our five to seven-year-olds get very somatic. They think about their bodies and germs and illness. They worry about natural disasters, um, storms, and they start to worry about school then. Seven to 12, they worry about performance anxiety, social situation, burglars, war. Um, I didn't include teenagers in here, but teenagers will also worry about school, fitting in with their peers, um, start to worry about dating. So I didn't mean to leave teenagers out, but we kind of focused on the, the younger kids. So just to frame it that some typical fears are normal. And like Kelly said, some anxiety is, is normal in everybody. It would be unusual if we didn't have it. So this uh, cartoon or slide um, is, is important because until we understand or realize what happens during anxiety, um, it, it's hard to manage it. So understanding is our best tool to dealing with anxiety. So Kelly already mentioned the flight, fright, or freeze, or FFF. And this is um, our primitive brain. When it senses fear or anxiety, we'll go into um, this mobilization mode for our bodies. It's a survival mode, and it's an effort for our bodies to protect ourselves about what the brain fears as danger. And this primitive brain kicks in before our rational brain can override it. So it's a primitive response. It's meant to help us, but it comes along with many of the physical symptoms that we experience in anxiety. So our pupils dilate, our heart will pound, our muscles will tense up, 
that's to prepare us for a fight, you know, if we were to fight our enemy. Um, and then our, again, heart races. We have blood flow that comes from our guts and goes out to our muscles, gets our muscles stronger, ready to run, run away from a tiger or an avalanche. And then the freeze is that kind of dry mouth feeling. Um, we, we can't talk. Again, blood is diverted to our muscles away from our gut, so people will feel nauseous. They feel that butterflies in their stomach, and that's the freeze. And in, in early times, it was so we could freeze to hide from a predator. So flight, fight, or freeze is a very real neurologic um, pathways that happens when our brain is triggered with fear and anxiety. So understanding it helps to manage it. Oops, sorry. So in an understanding how the, those physical symptoms show up, now we can talk about maybe some red flags of anxiety. So this is when the anxiety becomes really overwhelming. We start to see these symptoms kind of creep up and they'll cause extreme stress. And then that stress can lead to avoidance of activities that just make the kids uncomfortable or trigger more fear or worry. So what does that look like? Um, anxiety can present in uh, several different ways. Um, some of the most apparent ones are physical symptoms. So kids will complain a lot about headaches, stomach aches. They just don't feel right. They don't feel good. Um, again, if they have a rapid heart rate or heart palpitations, sometimes they'll sh say they get shaky or trembling. Sometimes they feel dizzy. And other times they'll complain about like numbness or tingling in their hands or feet. Um, and moving on to some of those emotional symptoms or behavioral symptoms of anxiety. This is something that's not as apparent. We don't always think of these symptoms when it comes to anxiety because they're more um, defiance, anger, or irritability sometimes can show up. So once a kid becomes anxious, they feel really chaotic inside like that fight, flight, or freeze, um, and they can't get rid of it or regulate it. So then it becomes defiant where they'll refuse to do things or want to avoid things. Sometimes they'll throw tantrums or they'll cry. They'll refuse to do what you're asking them to do. And then one other issue might be sleeping. Uh, sometimes kids will say they have so many thoughts in their head, they just can't slow their brain down, they can't slow the thoughts down, so they can't get themselves to sleep. Um, they'll also say they feel really restless, their body is still kind of shaky, and they can't settle down in order to get themselves to sleep. So we have a couple of pictures to kind of highlight what Kelly just talked about. Um, this little guy uh, is you know, someone might think, you know, is he having a tantrum? Is he just crying? But I think if you take a minute and put it in perspective, you can also consider as a parent, is there some anxiety? Is there some anxiousness that's triggering these emotional responses? Which is, which is, you know, his crying, his kind of scrunched up, worried looking face. So just to kind of highlight what Kelly just mentioned is how anxiety can present depending on the kid's personality and their different ages. So sleep. I thought we would take a couple minutes and just go through sleep by the different ages. In the office, probably um, sleep issues, kids not going to sleep or being afraid to go to sleep, wanting the parents to sleep with them, or wanting the, you know, the kids to pop in with the parents is probably one of the main, I guess, concerns or I don't want to use the word complaint from parents because it can be so disruptive in families when kids don't sleep. And um, we all realize that. Um, I think Kelly and I could do a whole webinar on sleep someday. Mm -hmm. We're just going to really touch on this um, with the different ages, just very briefly. So here's our preschool kid. I think everyone can recognize this picture of a distraught, you know, maybe four or five year old, um, not wanting to go to bed by themselves, wanting to go in probably to the parents' bed or have the parent lie with them. Here's middle school. Right around middle school, kids will really start to suffer a little bit of trouble with sleep onset. Um, probably what Kelly mentioned with thoughts swirling around in their head, that's probably a big, um, when kids can articulate what they're feeling, that's a big one, that they worry. They also watch the clock. So I put this picture there with the girl looking at the clock. Uh, they'll start to count the hours they could get to sleep if they fell asleep now. They start to then become very worried that they're not getting enough sleep. Um, 
you know, then the parents will get frustrated. So again, it can be very disruptive for the family. So we put this slide in to remind people that one strategy is to take the clock out of a middle school kid's room um, and reassure them that way. And then here's our teenager. Uh, we chose this photo because he's looking at his cell phone. And this was our prompt to remind people, and it would be brought up again, to really try and limit electronics, especially cell phones in the bedroom at night with our teenagers. It can be very disruptive, not only from the light it emits that interferes with our natural sleep hormone, melatonin, but also they can be texting off and on during the night. They might get worrisome texting or upsetting texts from their friends that can, again, interfere with their sleep and make them, um, make them relatively anxious, okay? So we'll get into uh, just briefly some different types of anxiety disorders. Um, and keep in mind, this is the, the anxiety disorders is when anxiety gets so much, uh, is so overwhelming that it's affecting everyday life for the kids and everyday functioning. Um, and typically the first three that we'll talk about real quick are the ones that we see in the office the most. Um, so the first one is generalized anxiety disorder. And this is just constant worry, running worry in their heads about really any any topic, there's nothing in particular, and sometimes it doesn't even make any sense about what they're worrying about. Uh, they'll worry about things that happened in the past that they have no control over, they just think they should have or could have done something differently, or they're thinking about things in the future that they really have no control over. One clue to parents is if you hear a what if question, that what if is big, that means they're probably worrying about something like what if I forget my homework? What if I fail a test? That's your clue that they're really kind of anxious about something. Um, the separation anxiety we touched on a little bit. It's just a, a child who's really afraid to be away from caregivers or parents. Um, and this could be the sleep issue. It could be even on separate levels of the home. The kid could be downstairs, parent could be upstairs, and the kid's just having a really hard time and being fearful being away from the parent. And most of the time you'll hear kids say, I don't want to be away from them because something bad may happen to them. Um, and then social anxiety. Um, sorry. <laughs> the social anxiety was the other one that we see the most. Um, and this is just kids who are fearful of social situations because they're afraid of being judged. Uh, they're afraid of being embarrassed or criticized. Um, oftentimes they'll say, um, if I go into a room and see people talking, they're probably judging me or talking about me <clears throat> when they really have no proof that people are doing that. Um, and then the other uh, disorders sometimes we'll see is panic disorder, selective mutism, and some specific phobias. Okay, so some of the um, reason that we prompted this talk is obviously COVID-19. So. COVID-19 pandemic is, is an anxiety. You may have read in the papers, even in the lay press, that there's been a big increase in mental health concerns among kids and teenagers since COVID-19. Um, so really the pandemic, just like all of us, but especially kids has disrupted their lives. Kids' worlds are composed of experiences at home, at school, in the community, and especially with their peers and friends. So changes to all of these, like what happened so drastically when we um, things kind of shut down last March, can be really dramatic. Add to that the lack of predictability. You know, kids were in school, out of school. It was going back. It wasn't going back. You know, schools would close down for a couple weeks at a time if there were outbreaks of COVID-19. Um, that can be stressful. And then, of course, the parents were stressed. Many um, parents had to work at home and also teach the kids or they, you know, keep an eye on the little ones. So it was very stressful for parents. And then there was also the fear of illness. A lot of grandparents got sick. Some people and little kids lost grandparents or, or relatives. So that all together really can make for a fair amount of anxiety. Social isolation, especially with our teenagers, the teenagers that were doing remote learning and miss that day-to-day -day contact with your peers. We talked a little bit about sleep and the importance of sleep, how it impacts our moods and our emotions. Sleep deprivation and tired kids, we all know, are irritable on a good day. So add some anxiety and some sleep deprivation from poor sleep hygiene 
and it can really exacerbate those feelings. Um, lack of exercise. In the office here, we've been seeing kids putting on some weight. You know, we talk about the COVID 10 or 15. And then unhealthy eating habits from people being at home and maybe eating and snacking a little bit more. All of these things really increase the risk of anxiety. And certainly we are seeing that reflected in our office. And we're trying to put some things in place so that we can mitigate some of this before the school starts. So we can talk a little bit about how um, <clears throat> symptoms show up when it comes to school. Symptoms of anxiety kind of show up the night before school even starts. So typically we'll call those like the Sunday scaries. Um, and typically you'll see some of those symptoms that we already talked about where kids will have a really difficult time falling asleep. Um, so they may just verbalize those worries. They may just stall or prolong going to bed. So they'll ask for several drinks, they'll ask for a snack, get up to go to the bathroom, those kind of things. Um, they'll also have those physical complaints. I have a headache, I have a stomach ache, I don't feel well. Um, and then they'll complain or worry about school. So you may hear those what if questions. What if my friend's not in school? What if I forget my homework? Uh, my teachers are mean to me, nobody likes me at school. So those are some of the typical worries or fears that you might hear the night before. And then um, the morning of school, sometimes um, kids can be difficult to wake up or they are literally in that freeze mode where they just can't get up or get themselves ready because they're so anxious to go to school, they just can't get up. Uh, they'll stall getting ready they will ask repeatedly to stay home. They'll say, I don't feel good. I have a headache. I have a stomach ache. Please let me stay home. They'll even bargain with you to stay home. If I stay home today, I'll go to school the next five days. I promise I'll do all my chores. Um, and then sometimes we talked about that defiance end of things where it just becomes so overwhelming. They just will refuse to get dressed or they'll cry or throw a tantrum or yell. Okay. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, and then once we get them out the door, some other symptoms of anxiety you may see uh, would be if they're driven to school, they refuse to get out of the car, refuse to walk into the school. Uh, again, with the physical complaints, that's a big one, headaches, stomach aches, which then lead to frequent and repeated trips to the nurse. Uh, they'll also asked to call home several times or they'll send repeated texts to parents asking to come be picked up. They'll say, I can't take this anymore. I don't feel good. You need to come and get me. Um, and then sometimes they'll also make frequent trips to the school social worker. So what can parents do? Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is managing your own anxiety. So the analogy I use for some of my parents is when um, they announce when you're flying and if there should be a bump in the flight and the oxygen mask comes down to put your own on and then apply one to your kids or your, um, your young ones. And I think this is the same idea. You can best help your kids if you can some way have supports and healthy outlets to manage your own anxiety. Um, stay up to date on safety guidelines. Um, check with your school districts, get the facts, you know, Try and if you get the facts and you stick with the facts, you can help your kids realize that there's a lot of misinformation and you're gonna look at the school district and put confidence in the adults that run the school and relay to their kids that adults, adults are in charge and they're keeping an eye on things and doing the best thing for the students. Try and turn off the news when you can. Um, kids have big ears, they're always listening and they can hear things that they just can't developmentally um, know how to interpret. So it can be a little bit overwhelming. The same thing with having conversations in front of your child. Try to leave your adult conversations for when you're with your adults um, and when you're in private. Kids, again, are listening, they're paying attention, even when they don't appear to be. They might appear to be playing a game on your phone or doing something while you're talking, but they're listening. Um, it's the same thing when you go to your uh, pediatrician's office. If you have something that's more adult-like, just say, you know, to your kids, I'm just going to go and talk to the doctor for a couple minutes about some paperwork and, and excuse yourself to the best interest if, of your kid. If, if your child senses or sees you worried, then they will become worried themselves. Um, they really, really do watch your face. 
Um, here we have a couple just again cartoons. You can see this little one having the tantrum, which again of crying, which can reflect some anxiety. And you can see that worried look on the mom's face. So if this kid were to open his eyes in an effort to look to the mom for support and saw that worried face on his mom, or this could be a dad, um, it, it probably wouldn't help. And in the same same idea, I'm sorry. Um, a reassuring of his mom's face. Um, again, there's a little one having a tantrum, could be anxiety. If she opened her eyes to calm down and look for reassurance from her mom, she would see that reassuring look. So kids will watch your face, they'll watch how you react to the news, to what's going on in the schools, and they'll really um, mimic, mimic you. Okay? Sorry guys, let me just... Just hold on everybody, we'll be back in a minute. Sorry, everybody, I'm just figuring out how to get the slides back on. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, kind of to go off of what uh, Dr. Matamora was just saying, what parents can do um, to help their kids. So we always want to be positive. Kids are resilient, but they need that encouragement. Um, they need to know that you're confident in handling these things. So remaining calm is important. We model that behavior for our kids. So they'll see us handling those fears and worries appropriately. So they will follow how we uh, handle those things. Um, and remember that it is not your job as a parent to eliminate that fear or avoid it because it actually will make the fear get worse because we know we have to manage that fear on some level um, and we have to identify it. So we have to start to challenge that a little bit. Um, we want to listen, reflect and validate our child's fears so that they feel heard and understood. Uh, remember that fear that they're feeling is real. It's real to them, so this is a big deal. So we can always tell them, you know, it sounds like you're really worried about this. I know this might be really hard for you right now. Um, and then you can always help them problem solve through some of those fears and focus on the things that they can control. So going back to those what if questions, if your child asks, what if I forget my homework? And we're going to put those questions back on them versus us telling them why they won't forget their homework. We're going to say, did you do your homework? Did you put it in your backpack? Did you put it in your folder? Are you ready for school? And when they answer yes to all those questions, we'll say, so do you what are the chances you think you might forget your homework? And they'll say, I probably won't because it's already done. And that's uh, to help them understand and process some of that worry. Okay, I'm back. So having, um, we're talking about getting a smooth transition back to school. Keep in mind that the goal is always to keep the kids going to school because um, if they miss school or avoid school, it is always harder to get them back. So they have to go back to school. Um, so consistency and routine is the way to do that. This takes that fear of the unknown out of things. This way kids know what to expect. They know what their role is every day. They know what they need to be doing every night to get ready. Um, if you're seeing some anxiety and you're unsure, have a family meeting, sit everybody down, get the kids input. Um, talk about when, uh, what nighttime routine will look like. Uh, make the lunches the night before, get the clothes out the night before. When is the bedtime? When do we hand in electronics? When do we have quiet time? Those type of things. 
Uh, you can always set a morning routine so kids know what they're responsible for in the morning and you can make checklists so as they get things done they can check it off and then have free time in the morning once they're done. Next one. Yep. And then um, you can always help them to think about the things they enjoy in school. So you can always uh, remind them of their friend that they're going to see the next day, a special that they enjoy, something like that. Um, and again, problem solve through those worries. You can always say, you know, it sounds like this worry is getting the better of you. Let's talk about that. Um, and practice the routine before school starts, you know, a week before, a week or two before school starts, have that family meeting, set the routine and start working on it, start practicing it. Um, if you still have trouble um, getting the kids ready for school, you can always have friends or family members help. You can always have a friend uh, meet them at school to walk in meet them at home or walk to school with. You can have an aunt or an uncle come to the house, help them get them on the bus um, and use your resources in school. You can always talk to the teacher, the social worker or the nurse, develop a plan. If, the, if your child continuously goes to the nurse, uh, tell the nurse, my kid's worried about a bunch of things, let them come down for a few minutes and then you can send them back to the classroom. And you always want to remember to give that positive feedback and praise for facing their fears because that fear, again, it's real to them. This is very difficult for them. So letting them know you see that is really big and helps to encourage them to face those fears. Um, if, it's continue, if they continue to be anxious or refuse to go to school, then it might be time to reach out and link with a counselor to really talk about any underlying symptoms they may have. Um, and you could call our office and I would help you with that process. Um, we put this in, it's a, a poster on um, some tools to manage anxiety. It's probably geared more towards actually parents or the older kids because there is a little slide in there about having some tea. I suppose kids could bring to caffeinated tea. But we liked it because it has elevated breathing. And I think if you could engage one tool to teach yourself and your kids, it would be elevator breathing, which um, people might know that as four, seven, eight. It's through um, your nose, you breathe in, pretending that the elevator is going up, your breath is raising an elevator up to your brain, and then you hold it there for seven seconds, and then you open your mouth and you breathe out for eight. It's a really effective tool to decrease that heart rate, to manage some of those physical symptoms of anxiety, and can be a great tool to practice with your kids, practice together, for when they feel that twinge of anxiety, they can engage this while they're sitting at their desk. And we thought it was, of all of these, a, a, a great tool to use, okay? All right, so COVID-19, you know, I know there's a lot of, you know, back and forth and there's a lot currently in the media, but the pediatricians, the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics, um, which is pediatricians across the whole country, really believe that in-school attendance is needed and it can improve all these symptoms that we're talking about for anxiety. It can offer children and families the structure that they need and the schedule. And just to reassure parents, looking at the next slide, um, you can see the picture of this girl. Kids will mask. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the pediatricians, really feel that masking is that added layer of protection while we get ourselves out of this pandemic. And we've been watching kids come in this office from two years old and up. And I'll be honest, I've never heard a kid complain about a mask. Um, we know it can get hot at school and it can be tedious, but I think kids are really resilient and as parents, we need to, to believe in them and, and strengthen, strengthen them um, for this next couple months that we have ahead of us. So now we have some resources at the end here, a slide of resources. Um, Kelly, you want to talk through those? Sure, yeah. Um, like we talked about earlier, you can always um, talk to the teachers, school social workers or counselors. They can check in on the kids or um, just develop a plan, like I said earlier, to help them get through those days. You can always call the pediatrician, call our office. Um, I can always help you navigate those things or um, meet with you and talk with you about what we can do to help out. The Parenting Network of Western New York has a whole bunch of resources, as does the New York Project Hope COVID resources. There's tons of articles and everything on there. Um, Kids Health, 
Child Mind Institute, all of those have a lot of resources, a lot of articles to go through. Um, and then we did add some apps at the end, Headspace, Calm, and Smiling Mind um, are all free apps you can use. They do have dedicated programs to kids. Um, so it will help to teach them to do some deep breathing or meditation or just help to keep themselves calm. Okay, so if you, you know, I don't see any questions currently in, in the chat room. We'll just kind of wrap up in the next minute or so in case someone has one to type in. But we hope this was helpful. We welcome any feedback. If anyone has any feedback on this or any future webinars that we can do, I promise to manage the technical aspect of it a little bit better. Um, but we're really happy that you joined us and we're here in the office if you ever have a question, give us a call. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. Oh, and there is a, um, a handout that is, is available of, of tonight's um, presentation. So our um, CEO back at the, the ranch, Chris Tirabasi, is going to get that um, available for everybody. And you can go on the MHA website, mhawesternyork.com, uh, to get the handouts. So thanks again for attending. And uh, any feedback, you know, shoot me, a, shoot me an email or give me a call. Same with Kelly. We're open yep. to any feedback or suggestions. Yep, anytime. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.